Hallelujah. Jesus lives. He's not still in the grave. He's still not in the grave. He's still not in the grave. Jesus is alive and well. He is up in heaven praying for us, seated at the right hand of the Father. Jesus is alive. He can change your life. He can take a drug addict and make him into a preacher of the gospel. He can take a sinner and make them a saint. Come on now, has anybody been saved? Let's go, praise the Lord. I don't like to sit back and just, I'm just a Christian, no. I've been saved, I've been healed, I've been delivered by the hands of Jesus Christ in the cross. Without the cross, we would not be able to be going on our way to heaven. We can't. We would never be able to do what God has called us to do. We would never be able to make it to heaven without the grace and the blood of Jesus Christ. We'd be still making sacrifices with animals that did not satisfy the hand of God. The heart of God. He will not take any other sacrifice. We cannot be good enough to be able to reach the heavenlies. By the blood of Jesus Christ, we can pray to our Father in heaven, and He will hear us when we believe in our heart. So let's give God a shout. Say hallelujah. hallelujah. Today is the day of salvation for Punxsutawney, Pennsylvania. Today is the day that we will reach people for Jesus Christ. We will not sit in the pews and wait for something to happen, but we're going to pray and believe that God is about to do something in this town. Today is a good day. It's Good Friday. Something good happened 2,000 years ago. And it's called the cross of Jesus Christ. Amen? Sorry, I got a little excited. Is that okay? Hallelujah. Today my message is called the message of the cross. The cross is the best known symbol to Christianity, known to man. We see it everywhere. We wear it around our necks. We hang it on our walls. We see it on every church steeple in America. And some even go as far as tattooing crosses on their bodies. To the Christian, it is viewed as a sign of love and power and gives us a reason to behold. It gives us a reason to ponder and look upon the cross. But to the unbeliever, it is viewed as a sign of dullness, stupidity, and foolishness with no reason to heed. That is the actual definition of foolishness. Some people see the cross as foolishness and some see it as the power of God. And that's how I vision it, the power of God. First Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18 and 19 says, For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Amen. We are looked at as fools when we preach the gospel of Jesus Christ to this lost and dying world. People think I'm crazy. You mean you're going to go out on the street and tell people about Jesus? Isn't that just a little bit bold? No, it's not. When you think about it, that person could be going to hell tomorrow and we're not doing anything. I have such a burning desire to reach people with Christ that it just burns on the inside of me and I just have to go out and tell people. I can't sit back and wait. That's just not me. I've been radically saved with the power of Jesus Christ and I want that to happen to every person in this street, every person in this city, and every place that I go where my feet, my feet would walk. The words of our message must penetrate the minds of those who would hear. It must captivate the thoughts and the reasoning of the mind of the unbeliever. The Bible says that the perishing are headed on paths of destruction in a prolonged form and they will fully be destroyed. How many people want to reach people so that they're not fully destroyed? We can't have them be destroyed. Not till I'm dead, <laughs> and I'm not gonna die. I'm gonna reach out, and I'm gonna touch these people in Jesus' name. They have been deceived in their minds, and they trust in their own understanding. How many times have you ever tried to talk to somebody about Jesus, and when you talk to them, they try to reason the cross of Christ 
in their minds. They can't, you can't reason it. it. It's foolishness to them. You can't reason about the cross of Christ, but it has to be by the Spirit. The, the better word for the tr they're trusting in their own understanding of their hearts would be their soul. In particular, it's their mind and their emotions. And the mind and your emotions, the Bible says, is deceitful and polluted in all of its ways. But to us, the cross by which was used as an instrument of death for capital punishment, disgrace, and shame brought us peace, brought us joy, brought us love, brought us redemption, and brought us salvation and healing and deliverance and everything that you may need in this life. He has brought it to us by the power of the cross. Amen. That is the power of God. What Christ has done for us is the power of God. By no means could any of us have done this for ourselves. Our sacrifice every day would not make God satisfied. But with the precious blood of the Lamb, but by the blood of Jesus Christ, we all can receive salvation through the power of the cross. Jesus is the gift of grace that was given to us. And Christ is the full manifestation of the love of the Father for us. John 19, 17 through 18 says, Carrying his own cross, carrying his own cross, he went out to the place of the skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. Even though the Romans, the Romans did not invent the crucifixion, but the Persians did. Anybody know where the Persians come from? The Persian people, when you read about the Persians, it's Iran. But what happened was, is the Roman people actually took it and they had perfected it. They adopted their way of cap, uh, capital punishment around the time that Jesus was born. You see how the devil was working that out? At the time that Jesus was born was the time that the Romans adopted the crucifixion so it was even in place way back then it was designed to maximize the pain and suffering of the cross carrier not by killing them but by torturing them and torturing those victims to the place where they just couldn't take it anymore and then they probably laughed about it there was only one time that a Roman citizen suffered the crucifixion and he was a soldier that left the army and he deserted it and then after the Roman people seen this and witnessed this crucifying, horrifying death, the Roman people had so much fear that they would not come against the government or the law again. But I wonder so much if we still had crucifixion in America today. Can you imagine how much crime would be here? Probably nothing. There would probably be no crime. Flogging. It was a normal action before the crucifixion. It was a beating with a with a three thong whip made of leather, leather, and it was studded with bones of sheep. It had animal claws on it and pieces of metal, so that whenever they would hit the the victim, it would rip their skin right off, and it would cause deep gashes. Um, it was actually reported that people's lungs and intestines and things you could actually see them at the end of a flogging. So this is what happened. Jesus was stripped totally naked, tied to a wooden stake, and was whipped and beaten with rods till almost death. Because they did it to a place. That's what the Romans did. They did it to a place to where they almost died. But they didn't let the person die because they wanted to torture them just a little bit more. They would quick, they would quickly stop and just wait and watch their suffer, the, the people suffer. Jesus was flogged. Then what they would do, is they would carry a crossbar. And this crossbar was 75 to 125 pounds. And they would place it on, on the back of the shoulders of the victim. And they would tie it securely. So from the flogging and the whipping, I'm sure the person was very weak and tired. And when they would fall, they did this on purpose, that when the victim would fall, they would fall face first into the dirt because they didn't have their hands to stop their fall. Jesus fell. How many times did he fall? We don't know for sure. He fell face first into the dirt. Our Savior, our King, our God. 
Along the way, Simon was forced to carry the cross behind Jesus as they made the mile-long journey up to the place of the skull. I want you to hear me on this. If you don't take anything else I ever said, I want you to hear me. At that time, to carry the cross was an admission of guilt. Admission of guilt. Why do you think Simon didn't want to carry the cross? It was admitting that he was associated with that guilty party. If you seen someone carrying a cross down the street, you would not want to be there. You would not want to be around them. People would run. They did not want to carry the cross and admit that they were guilty. Of course, Jesus was not guilty, but he took our guilt. Jesus said in Luke 9, 23 and 24, he said, Then he said to all of them, If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for me will save it. What was Jesus asking of us to do? What was he asking us to do? Take up our cross daily and follow him. Taking up your cross is showing that you are guilty. People, you, you would ask them, oh, have you ever lied in your entire, li entire life? No, I'm a, I'm a good person. Have you ever stolen anything? No, I've never done that. Have you ever done anything bad? No, I'm a good person. I'm going to make it to heaven. God said that if you would take up your cross, you have to admit that you are guilty. And you know, that's hard for some people. But when you are guilty, there is a punishment that would happen to you. And nobody wants to receive a punishment. So nobody wants to admit that they're guilty. They all want to have pride. I'm just talking in general. Anyone. It could be Christian, non-Christian. But remember that it took two people to carry the cross and receive what he did. Two people. Jesus and you. When we come to him, we must admit our guilt, confess our sins, and repent. Don't forget the repentance. A lot of people say, just accept Jesus. No, you have to repent. You have to turn from your sin. You have to. If you say, okay, I accept you, Jesus, and go out and live in the way that you want, and you don't repent, I don't believe that you have really accepted Jesus because he said, if you love me, you will follow my commands. We have to confess our sins because he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And then after we repent from our sins, then we must trust him to have eternal life. If you say you have no sin, the Bible says that the truth is not in you. And, but it's hard. It's hard to humble yourself. And it's hard to be uh, saying, yeah, I was wrong. You know, that's hard to say, yeah, if I was wrong. It's very hard to do that. But when saying I'm wrong, please forgive me. There's so much freedom in it. If you want to be free, admit your guilt. Amen. Admit your shame. Admit all your sins to Jesus. Talk to him about it and he'll take them from you. And you will be saved. The cross was designed for four people. You know, they just didn't have the cross out there for everybody. There's four designs, de designated people for the cross. I'm going to talk about all four of these. The first one was for slaves. If slaves were disobedient, they were taking up the cross. And you know what? We were slaves to sin. The Bible says in Romans chapter 6, when you were slaves to sin, you were free from the control of righteousness. That just blows my mind. Now I'm not a slave to sin anymore, but I'm a slave to God, and I believe that the righteousness of God will control me. I want it to so much. I want holiness. I want to be pure. I want to be clean. I want to be so pure before the Lord. I want to please Him with all my heart. But what benefit did you reap at the time from when the things you are now ashamed of, those things result in death, but now that you have been set free from sin, and have become slaves to God, the benefit you reap leads to holiness, and the result is eternal life. 
for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. The cross is for you. The cross is for me. We admit our guilt today, and we're going to follow him Amen. daily. Amen. Number two, the cross was designed for foreigners. The cross was designed for foreigners. Peter and Paul both talk about us being strangers in this world because it's not our home because we are part of the kingdom of God. We do not fit in this world's mold. I know I don't. I don't fit in this world's mold. I don't do what the world does. And we don't follow after the world's pattern. We are strangers and foreigners here. So when I stand up for righteousness, people go, what? You're gonna stand for righteousness? You mean you're just gonna like come against when people would sin and you're just gonna say, hey, please don't do that. That's not godly. You wait to have sex before marriage? Oh my goodness. Wow. What? That doesn't make sense. I'm going to take a stand for righteousness. You don't cuss? What are you talking about? Everybody cusses. You know? Things like that. The cross was designed for foreigners. I'm going to stand for righteousness. The cross was designed for you and me. Take up your cross and follow him. The third people it was designated for which I fall under this category and a lot of other people in this place do is the cross was designed for revolutionists you know people would come into Rome and come into Israel and they would try to start up a revolution I remember back in 19 what 99 maybe you can help me out there's a song uh, Kirk Franklin do you want a revolution and they go whoop, whoop, you know I'm thinking I think about that song do you want a revolution are we going to sit back and let the devil and, and the government take over this world? No. Jesus Christ is the king of this world, and we're going to start standing up for righteousness and believe in God to change government. Start, start voting. Start praying that God's going to do something in our government because it's starting to be really corrupt. Just make sure that nobody's going to shoot me or something. I feel like Martin Luther King here. <laughs> But we are about to start a revolution. We are letting everyone know today that today is the day of salvation. No longer can we sit back and let the far left speak up about their standard of living and involvement in their sinful behaviors while we have to hush hush. It is not going to happen. We cannot procrastinate in the calling of Christ that has been in our hearts and in our lives. We have to go out and touch people. The last thing that Jesus, you know, last words are important. The last thing that Jesus told us to do is go into all the world and preach the gospel. And that is our mission go into all the world and preach the gospel I'm ready to start a revolution and I believe it's gonna start here today when we stand here right now I'm gonna share a fact with you as we stand here right now every single day of our lives 150,000 people die every day could be here could be in Africa could be wherever 150,000 people a day. Let me share it so you can actually grasp the number. Two every second. Someone, two people died. 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 Does that bring a reality to you? And when you look up and you take, uh, they took surveys of what religion and does Christ have a meaningful relationship with you? And it found out that one out of four said, yeah, I'm a Christian, but well, so even half of the one out of four may be going to heaven because you have to have a meaningful relationship with Jesus Christ to be there. Two people every second. And those statistics is why I'm doing things outside today. And that's the reason why I need to reach the lost with Jesus. Can we wait for someone else to share the gospel truth with them? Someone else is waiting for you to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with them. I believe that there is a time coming, and now is when people will not all come over here. Where's little Phil? Is he over there? I believe there's a time. That people, you know, people all over the world come to see this groundhog. And he comes out of the ground to see or not to see his shadow. And then he predicts when spring is about to arrive. 
Well, I'm believing God that there's going to be a time when people are coming from the north and from the south and the east and from the west to hear about a Savior, Jesus Christ, the Redeemer of the world, that will be with you in the valley of the shadow of death so you fear no evil and no matter what season of life you're in. I'm ready. Are you ready? Yes. Let's go get these people. Let's go reach the world for Jesus. The cross was designed for, number four, criminals. Maybe you're someone who has never admitted your guilt. The Bible says that through the law, we would be conscious of sin. Look at it this way. If you have ever kept the Ten Commandments, have you ever lied or stolen, looked with lust? Have you ever hated someone in your heart? If you've ever done any of those things, you come under the law, and the punishment of the law is death. But through Jesus Christ and His blood, and by the grace of God, you come under grace, and you come under the blood of Jesus Christ, and you can be saved. I want you to see that today, that Jesus Christ has paid your fine. Our God is just and holy and will only accept the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus as our payment on our behalf. He took our punishment, he took up the cross for our sins, and he took our guilt by carrying your cross. Will you carry the cross for him? Now he asks you to admit your guilt. Carry the cross daily and follow him. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 2 and 3 says, Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and the perfecter of our faith. For by the joy set before him, endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the Father. You know what that joy set before him was? It was you. It was me. He knew that he would have sisters and brothers in heaven with him if he would just grab a hold of this cross and carry it. Suffering flogging, spit upon, beard ripped out of his face. He carried the cross so that we could be with him. You were his joy. You were his joy. Can you imagine carrying a cross and being joyful about it? He's seen your soul in heaven and out of hell. That's why he carried the cross. Hi, I'm Pastor Nicole Balzer. Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 27 says that a man is destined to die once and after that to face judgment. There are two judgments. One is for the saved and one is for the damned. Everyone is going to carry their cross, so to speak, not a physical cross like this one. But what I'm saying is this, is that we will all stand before God, guilty or not guilty. When Jesus asked us to carry cross and follow him, he wanted us to admit our guilt so that he could carry our sins on his shoulders. To follow him is to trust him and to love him, and to love him is to obey him. Whether we like it or not, we will all have to walk that long road with him or without him all alone. And that choice is up to us. John chapter 12 and 31, Jesus says that now is the time for judgment on this world. Now the prince of this world will be driven out. He said this knowing what he was about to endure. But you see, he had that joy that was set before him. Yes, that joy was you. His eyes seen you with him enjoying everlasting life and out of the torment of hell. That was enough to drive him to suffer the cross. He said that if I be lifted up, I would draw all men unto me. You know, in the garden, the judgment of the entire world began to fall upon him. And at the grave, it was finished. He had defeated sin and gave us the victory by the resurrection. He is alive today. He was dead and was raised from the dead with the keys to death and hell in his hands. Not only that, he disarmed the powers and authorities and made a public spectacle of them when he triumphed over them by the cross. Those weapons that the enemy had will no longer prosper over you if you choose to believe in him. So my question to you today is this. Will you trust him with your sin? Will you follow him with all your heart? 
Will you repent of your sin and turn away from it so that you can have eternal life and stand before God not guilty? So let's pray. You know, prayer is just simply talking to God and telling Him how you feel. He wants you to talk to Him. You know, He died to have that fellowship and that relationship with you. So let's do that. Father, I just pray right now in the name of Jesus for everyone watching. And Father, I just pray, Lord God, that you would touch their hearts and touch their lives. And Father, I just pray salvation into the lives of your people right now in Jesus' name. And I thank you and praise you. If you have decided to give your life to Jesus today, or if this message touched your heart in any way, send me an email so I can hear your testimony at markforlifeministries at gmail.com. Now know that you have been marked for life.